Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope you are doing all right and ready to learn some physics. So, so far in the semester, we have covered three main ideas, kinematics, dynamics, and conservation principles. And we will be talking about two conservation principles this semester. One is conservation of energy, which we finished talking. Another one is conservation of momentum. So today we're going to be heading towards conservation of momentum. So before we actually talk about conservation of momentum, we need to first talk about some vocabularies or definitions, just like we do uh, for every new topics. So we'll first learn about momentum and how momentum is related to what we call impulse. So mostly we will be focusing on that today and their application. And next class, we will be learning about conservation of momentum and its use in solving problems. With that, we will be finished with all the three main basic physics we are learning in this class. So after that, it's going to be just application of those basic physics in different situation. And depending on situation, we may modify them slightly, but basic physics is basic physics. So those things. So kinematics. Do you know what kinematics equations are and how to use them? What's the vocabularies? Make sure you learn them, right? And laws of motion. So three laws of motion. What do they really mean? How to use them by drawing free body diagrams and so on. And then conservation of energy. So to use conservation of energy, we learn that we draw or indicate three things in this case, initial, final, and reference. And after that, we write the equation. And the equation may be slightly different when there is friction force. Do you remember those? So these are basic idea you should have always in your head while doing physics, okay? So with that said, let's uh, talk about momentum. So for momentum, let's uh, start from basically Newton's law. And this is Newton's second law written without any, hmm, without any component. So remember, you can write this in terms of component like this or component like that. That's how we do it while solving problems. But in general, we can also write something like this. And these are just the sign that these are vectors. Okay. Oops. Hmm. Okay. This thing is acting a bit weird. Sorry about that. Let me fix that. So now we can use the definition of acceleration, which is change in velocity over time. So we can just write this as a V2 minus V1 or Bf minus Vi, same thing, okay? We can also do that. If we do that, this is gonna be Bf, Vi, right? So basically one, two, or initial, final, the same thing. So you see here, there is a repetition of product of mass and velocity. So when we're talking about work and energy, we had this quantity that was repeating. The product of mass and velocity squared. 
and there was half in front, we said, okay, this is kinetic energy. Okay. Similarly, now we have this thing, mass and velocity, just mass and velocity, not the squared. And there is no half there. Mass times velocity, mass times velocity. So that term we call momentum. So what we have is now change in momentum over time interval, okay? So what is momentum? Product of mass and velocity. And we denote momentum by lowercase p, okay? Just like kinetic energy half mb square, momentum is mass times velocity. So another fundamental uh, quantity, okay? And you can see the momentum basically came from the Newton's second law. So when Newton wrote second law, Newton did not write second law like this. Okay, rather wrote something like this. So what is that? So here we are saying net force is mass times acceleration, but here in terms of momentum, same thing becomes net force is equal to rate of change of momentum because this is change in momentum over time. So whenever something is changing over time, we say rate of change, right? So we say that rate of change, so that's why it is rate of change of momentum, okay? And so, So that's how the Newton wrote second law. So what that means? So we can talk dynamics problem in terms of just momentum. We don't even need force. We can just write in terms of momentum as well, okay? And so that's what it means. They are closely related, but they are not same. Okay, so that is momentum. And its unit is kilogram meter divided by second. So it basically comes from the unit of mass, which is kilogram, and unit of speed, which is meter per second. So together it becomes kilogram meter per second. So there is no shorthand notation for the unit of momentum. Remember we had kilogram meter over second square, that was the Newton, because it's a mass times acceleration, and unit of mass is kilogram, and this is the unit of acceleration. So we have this shortened version, and this one looks very similar to that, okay? So actually, indeed, if we multiply both sides by seconds, let's say, what happens? One of the second here cancels, so giving us exactly this, okay? So that means Newton times second is another way of writing the unit of momentum. So momentum can be written as, or the unit of momentum can be written as product of these two kilogram meter over second or Newton's times second. So later, once we write this uh, momentum and impulse relationship, and then in that case, this becomes even more, you know, uh, let's say explicit. So net force is rate of change of momentum. That is the Newton's second law. Okay, so momentum is product of mass and velocity. So that means just by looking at equation, we should be able to tell momentum changes if mass changes or velocity changes or both of them changes, right? 
So often mass does not change unless object is exploding, breaking, and so on, okay? Usually mass remains same. So that means momentum basically changes. Momentum of an object, I should say, changes when simply velocity is changing, okay? But if we are comparing the momentum of two objects, then we need to look at how the mass changed, how the velocity changed. Just like in case of kinetic energy, you cannot just tell what's happening to kinetic energy just by looking at mass or velocity. You need to look at both mass and velocity. Same thing goes with the momentum as well. And by the way, kinetic energy and momentum, they are also related. You can write kinetic energy in terms of momentum which I'm not doing it here, but uh, sometimes you may see it's written P square over 2M. So you see, if you plug in this one over here, you will get same thing back, okay? So that is, now we can rearrange this equation. See this? First, very first term and the last term in that equation. So this is change in momentum. So if I solve for this by bringing this T or change in time interval on this side, I get this, okay? This quantity, product of net force times time interval is called impulse, okay? That quantity is called impulse. So, and turns out the impulse is equal to change in momentum. So what's the definition of impulse? Change in momentum is not the definition of impulse. Definition of impulse is this product of force over time interval. But that happens to be equal to change in momentum according to Newton's second law, okay? So let's keep that in mind. So this impulse is force in, you know, exerted over time interval. So impulse is not just force, not just time interval, but it's product of both. So it depends on the product of both of them. So longer the time, you know, if you apply force for longer time, then what happens? You have larger impulse. And of course, if you apply large force, large net force, then you have large impulse as well. So overall, it's the product of these two. So that's the impulse. So you see here, this is time interval here. So often what happens is we are looking at how the momentum changes when force is acting over a smaller time interval or larger time interval. So we can do that comparison. And since the momentum is product of mass and velocity, we can tell how the velocity is changing when we are applying a force over longer time interval versus shorter time interval. So that's what this equation is telling us, okay? So that's the impulse that is force exerted over time and this change in momentum is equal to impulse. And remember, uh, we've been writing final minus initial for change, which is same as P2 minus P1 or P4 minus uh, P3 would be anything, just the change in momentum. Remember change means, uh, let's say later minus previous, right? So we can write that anyway. There are several different ways we can lie, write that. So P2 minus P1 is one, or PF minus PI is another one, okay? So now, looking at this equation, see this is change in momentum. So if you wanna make final momentum larger, that means you have to have final speed larger for an object, right? So since the momentum is product of mass and velocity, if mass is not changing for momentum to be larger for an object, what has to happen? Velocity has to be larger. So that means if we want 
something to start with larger velocity, then in that case, what we need to do, we need to apply force for longer time interval, okay? Apply larger force for larger time interval or longer time interval. So here is a picture a frog jumping off from a branch or maybe even just a leaf. Okay, so what do you see here? Frog goes from this folded legs to a straight leg while leaving the branch. Okay, starts with folded leg and then goes to a straight leg while leaving the branch. So what's happening here? So going from folded to straight, okay, it takes some time. So while you are on the branch or some object, you can apply force on that object. So when you go from, you know, folded to straight, you are applying force for longer time interval. So longer time interval means longer change in momentum or larger change in momentum means larger final speed. So just like if you are trying to jump off from the ground, if you just jump with your straight legs, something like this, you're not gonna jump higher, very high, okay? But if you pull your legs and then jump, what happens? You can jump a bit higher. Why is that case? Because you are applying whatever force you could for longer time interval while doing that, okay? So you can apply force on the ground, you know, until you are still touching the ground. But once you leave the ground, you're not applying that force anymore, means that time interval of the force application becomes, you know, that, that basically does not count once you leave the ground. So to make the time interval longer, you have to be in ground as long as possible. And that's why holding your knees or the legs before you jump gets you higher than just jumping straight without folding your legs. And that's what you see here in case of the uh, frog jumping on this branch. So. Probably you can guess, Frog did not take physics class, but already knows how to jump higher, better, okay? It's in their DNA, so it's a nature, okay? We are barely just scratching the laws that exist in the nature, and that's what the physics is about, okay? So now, with that said, so in short, momentum is product of mass and velocity. And Newton's second law can be written in terms of rate of change of momentum. And change in momentum is equal to impulse. Okay. And we can get larger impulse by applying force for longer time interval. Once we make impulse larger, what happens? The final momentum also becomes larger, giving us large change in momentum or resulting in larger or higher final velocity. So that's what we basically learn here. So now you have a, uh, I have a question for you. So what do you think? A simple question here. And you have a minute for this question. Thirty more seconds.
and five more seconds five four three two one and it stops okay so let's see how did we do so mostly a and there is c as well so yeah c it says force applied multiplied by distance but it is not distance, but it's supposed to be time. Force applied multiplied by time is the impulse. So that's why this is not correct. This is correct. Force momentum is, or impulse is equal to change in momentum. The product of mass and acceleration, this is force, right? And force multiplied by distance is actually work. And rate of change of velocity is acceleration, which no none of you chose. That's good. So you know acceleration. So that's the change in momentum. So A is correct answer. So now here is another question. So in this case, what's happening is this ball goes and hits the wall and bounces back. Okay. Let's see if I can run that goes hits the wall and bounces back. So that means it has initial velocity in this direction, means it has initial momentum in that direction, okay? And then it turns around, so final velocity or final momentum is in that direction, but Initial velocity and final velocity, they have same value. Direction changed, but the value is same, okay? So that's what it is talking about. So now the question is, change in momentum. Change in momentum means final minus initial, okay? Or MBF minus MBI. So what is it? So it may seem obvious, but I see, uh, you know, quite a few students make mistake on this question. So pay attention. And even uh, they are, see the momentum going this way and momentum coming this way. So you are finding change in momentum. You can also do it by using tail to tail and tip to tip rule if you like. But anyway, I'll let you work on this. And you have two minutes from now, okay? So see, I'm giving you two minutes. So answer is not obvious one, okay? So keep that in mind. So make sure you pay attention. Thirty more seconds. Five more seconds. Five, four, three, two. One and it 
stats. Okay, so let's see what we got. So we got all of them. So that tells us we have to be careful, just like I said. Okay, so let's uh, do it. And by the way, this question, I could have asked this question saying, okay, what is impulse? Okay, or impulse. Impulse and change in momentum, they are same. So this question can be asked in terms of impulse as well. If that was the case, you could write impulse is change in momentum and that. So you can find the impulse two different ways. One, by using formula force times time interval, right? If the velocities are given, then you can think of in terms of change in momentum. So now with that said, So let's first just uh, do this without drawing anything. In change in momentum means MBF minus MBI, okay? So velocities and momentum, they are vector. So that means now we need to be careful about the direction as well, okay? So BI is pointing this way to the left. If I say left is positive, let's say this is positive, then this would be negative. This is going to be negative, okay? And so positive versus negative. So that means EI is, let's say, positive B, and VF is negative B. So that's the difference there. The value is same, but the direction is opposite. Momentum being vector quantity, why is it vector? Because it's the product of mass and velocity, and velocity is vector, mass is not. So the momentum is a vector, and its direction is same as the direction of velocity. Okay, so that's that. So that means a change in momentum, which can be written as MBF minus MBI, is MVF means negative V and there is negative sign here and VI is positive V. So mass times negative V means negative MB and this is negative times positive it's simply negative so that means that so two negative makes you know negative MB and negative MB means it's two times mb negative sign, okay? So here, negative means what? Mm. So based on our choice, negative is to the right, okay? The positive was to the left. So this is right. So that means I can write that as a two mb and right. Okay, so that is that. So D is correct answer. So now, if you are wondering, what if I choose left as a negative, and that's what we usually do, and right as a positive, will the answer be different? It shouldn't. Choice of coordinates shouldn't make the, diff you know, shouldn't give the different answer. So that we can see it from here. So for example, now VI becomes negative and VF becomes positive. So that means this is positive and this is negative. Negative times negative is now positive, no negative here. So MB and positive MB means positive to MB and positive in this case is to the right so the answer is still same, okay? So physics does not change based on how, you know, what kind of coordinate we used. So now I also said, okay, in some cases, if you are just given two vectors like this, what's the change in momentum? Just like when you have two velocity vectors, Vi, Vf, 
you learn how to draw a change in velocity vector by drawing tails together first and then by drawing from the tip of initial to final right so that is change in velocity so process is same for the momentum as well or for any vectors in that matter so that means in case of momentum what we have is this right so let's draw tails together so they are just pointing in opposite direction so that means it's going to be like that so pi is this and pf final momentum is that so that is step one we draw tails tail, tail and tail together see here we are subtracting two vector finding difference finding change means we are subtracting so to, to subtract we can draw something like this that's step one and then in step two we draw starting from tail of initial to tail of final so that is change okay which is step two so now you can see it's pointing to the right you see the change is pointing to the right and its length is longer than both pi and pf actually it is equal to length is equal to sum of pi and pf both length okay i'm talking about value so when i'm just finding value this whole length that length starts from here so up to there this is mb and up to there that is mb those are the length so that means the whole length going to be mb plus mb means 2mb so 2mb length and pointing to the right so we can also find by just drawing as well in some cases okay so for example here is a question for you where is asking you to find impulse and remember impulse is equal to change in momentum so that means you can just uh, find the change in momentum so in this case there is no mass and velocity so you cannot just write mbf minus mbi and do the calculation you cannot do that here because these velocities are not given so what do you do you use that drawing method okay geometric method and now your turn go ahead so here this is coming this way means this is pi this is pf okay so go ahead and draw this using those two steps method and choose correct answer so you have a minute and 30 seconds to answer this question Thirty seconds. And five more seconds. Five, four, three, two one and it stops okay so let's see what we got here so mostly a and there is c as well okay so in this case a is correct answer 
So how do I do that? So probably if you did see, you did not put the tails together. See, the tip is here and tail is there. So tip, tail, tail to the tip, not tail to the tail. So that means if you are doing this, you are adding, you are adding, that's what you are doing, okay? So if you chose C, that means you found the sum of these, not the difference. See, this is a difference or change we are looking for, right? So for that, what we have to do, bring tail to the tip. Sorry, yeah, sorry, bring tail to the tail, not tip. Do you want to do that? See, this is going that way, so I'm just drawing that over there. Once I have that, that's a step one. And step two, from tip of previous or initial to tip of final, so it goes like that. So that is our change or impulse. So that's why A is right answer here. Okay. So now I have this video from YouTube. So if I record this with my, you know, for this lecture and then put that in the YouTube, YouTube may say copyright and so on. So that's why I'll pause the recording, okay? Uh, but uh, I, I have to turn this back on later. Uh, so if I forget, uh, remind me. But for now, I'm gonna be turning it off. But before I turn it off, see here, uh, what's going on? This person going to put themselves on fire and then going to jump off from the roof. And this is not just three-story building. It is seven or eight-story building. I kind of forgot. And then there is a snow pile. So this person jumps in the snow pile. Okay. So snow helps to extinguish the fire, but it also helps from breaking the bones, right? This person probably wouldn't jump off unless this person is trying to just kill themselves, right? Uh, so here, there is pile of ice. So how does that help to not to break the bone or not to kill the person, okay? So that is question uh, we need to think while watching this video. For meantime, I will Pause the recording. Okay. So as we can see here, this person just uh, walks without any broken bone or anything like that, right? So how do we explain using what we learn? You know, why the snow pile was helpful? How do we explain that, right? So for that, we can use that change in impulse over time, you know, change in impulse is equal to, uh, let's say, sorry, change in momentum is equal to impulse idea, okay? So, change in momentum is impulse or impulse, let's just write first times time interval just for, you know, simplicity a change in momentum, change in momentum. So what change in momentum we are looking at? See, this person jumps off from the roof or the, you know, that, and then arrives to the snow pile, okay, snow pile. So remember, this time is time interval, so that is time of contact. Not all the time, but time of contact. So that means we should be looking at the time at which the person starts making contact to the snow pile, okay? So that would be initial time and final time when the person stops actually, okay? Uh, so the person goes through this pile of the snow. So that's when it is interacting with the snow. So that's what we should be looking at, okay? 
So this portion arrives with some initial velocity and final velocity becomes zero, right? So that's what's happening here. So portion it touches the snow pile with some initial velocity and then final velocity becomes zero, right? So now what's the difference between the snow pile versus just the, you know, road? No, it's snow pile. So what happens is snow pile increases the time of interaction. So it takes longer for the portion to stop. So Let's say this time is here, let's solve for force. How much force is acting on the portion, okay? So we see longer time or larger time means smaller force. They are inversely related. So force acting on the portion becomes smaller. So that's why we can jump on the mattress, but uh, I mean, you know, you can fall on the mattress without hurting yourself, but you cannot do that on the bare floor. Why? On the bare floor, time of interaction is short. Shorter time means larger force. Force and time interval, they are inversely related based on this equation, okay? So, other way around, for example, let's say if you like ball games, if you understand ball game, or maybe you know cricket. I'm talking about game, not the bug, okay? <laughs> and so what happens over there? So if you wanna hit home run, that means you have your ball has to leave your bat with highest possible speed, okay? So that means its final momentum has to be largest possible. Means change in momentum has to be largest. And one person, person has only so much force a person can apply, for example. So what happens is this person has to swing the bat all the way. So that means the person, the player, keeps the bat in contact with the ball longest time possible. Same thing goes with the kicking the soccer ball. If you want that to go farthest, similarly kicking the, you know, and let's say uh, football as well, and so on. So that's the idea, okay? So we see there are a lot of examples that we use that is that can be explained by using this impulse momentum theorem, okay? So here is another video And this is from the, you know, like uh, when they do the testing of the safety of a vehicle, right? There is safety rating for a vehicle for collision. Probably you may have, uh, you know, noticed or you may even pay attention while buying a vehicle, right? How safe it is in, in case it collides or you know, like let's say crashes. So that's what this is about. Hopefully, this is uh, not going to go to the copyright, so I'll just let it record.
I guess that's uh, good enough. So I have a question for you. And you have a minute to answer this question. Okay, 30 more seconds. And five more seconds, five. Four, three, two, one, and it stops. Let's see what we got here. So mostly B and there are C and D as well. So increasing the time over which the momentum, yes. So just like the snow pile increase the time that goes from certain velocity to zero velocity, right? So your body is moving with the speed of car. And when car collides, car suddenly comes to the stop or slows down. But according to Newton's first law of motion, your body keeps moving, right? And uh, so that means to stop from moving, what has to happen? Seat belt, one, of course. So that helps your overall body, you know, ejecting from the car, seat belt. But at the same time, this airbags basically during the collision what happens the collision time becomes longer means force on your body is now smaller than what it would be without the airbag or the cushion okay so always put seat belt on even when you are sitting on back seat of the car okay and uh, of course Airbags should be functioning, hope <laughs> they function in case of collision. And now here is another short video. Okay. So this one I'm not sure about, so I'm gonna pause the recording. Remember I talked about every object kind of acts like a spring, okay? So that's what you see here in action. So it is like getting squeezed, like uh, when you, you know, push the spring, what happens? It gets shorter, right? So compressed spring. So this ball is acting like a compressed spring during this collision. I mean, at the beginning of, at the middle of collision, I should say, and then it springs back. Uh, so, it is an example where the force is not constant in the collision, okay? So I have very similar picture here. So there is a soccer ball here. So this is when the contact just begins. So if I were to look at the force versus time graph, okay? So until your leg you know touches the ball the force is zero because force on the ball is zero we are interested in force on the ball so that's why here this line is zero and then suddenly what happens once the contact begins it certainly rises reaches to a maximum value when it is maximally compressed like this like a golf ball Soccer ball also compresses. You see, it looks like a D shape, okay? So that's when the maximum force is. And then once the soccer ball starts leaving the foot, what happens? This one decreases just like it increased on the other side. 
And once the soccer ball leaves the contact to the foot, what happens? There is no force on the soccer ball anymore from the foot, right? Uh, because, uh, see, this is contact force. Once contact is not there, that force cannot keep acting on it, right? So it gives some momentum, final momentum or final velocity. And it's that velocity that makes this soccer ball go, right? So that's what's happening. So now we said, okay, the impulse is product of force and time. But here, what's happening is force is changing. So what force should we be using? If we just use this force, oops, that's not going to be good enough because there was larger force. So, so impulse is product of force and time. And what is this plot? Force and time. So when we have, remember we had a plot of force and displacement. And since the product of force and displacement gives you work done, we said, okay, work done is area under that. And we can use the same idea now in, in, in place of displacement, what we have is time interval here, okay? So, so when we find area under, we're gonna get impulse okay area under the curve is product of these two quantities and based on physics product of these quantities is called impulse and which happens to be also equal to change in momentum so that's that so that's what i'm writing here so we can use area under the curve and that gives us product of force and time interval. So that is like impulse, okay? So how do we find impulse? From force versus time graph, just find the area under. And why is that? Because impulse is product of force times time interval. And when we have a graph, and if we find area under that graph, what do we get? we get the product of the quantities in the vertical and horizontal axis. Here in vertical axis, force, horizontal axis, time. Okay, so that's what it is. So now we can also, so, so how do I find the area of this one? We haven't learned how to find the area of this bell curve, right? So for that, we need to use calculus, but we're not using calculus in this class. So we wanna simplify that. So how do we do that? So it turns out that this kind of shaped curve looks something like this if we just use the average force, okay? So force is zero here, maximum over there, average is somewhere there, let's say. So if we were to draw a rectangle under the average force starting for the same time interval, I mean, during the same time interval, you're gonna get rectangle because average force has a fixed value. Average force is not changing, force is changing. So we are finding average out of those changing forces means force has a fixed value. So that means it's gonna be a straight horizontal line. So finding area under this, we know it's a rectangle, so we can find the area. So what happens is rather than saying impulse is force times time interval, we can also say the impulse is average force times time interval. And find the area under something like that. So, so this is the main concept here. So you can go from force times time interval and to find the that value, you need to find the area of something like this. But once we go to the average force times time interval, we get this area. And turns out that this area rectangle, area of this rectangle is equal to the area of that one. So this is work around without using calculus, okay? So as an example that uh, this kind of area is same as the area of this rectangle, 
again i cannot find the area of this bell shaped curve but i can find the area of triangle that is close to a bell shape for example right so i can find area of this triangle and i can find the area of rectangle finding the average force okay and can check if those areas are equal okay so before I do that, let's take a break. Looks like this is a good time to take a break. And after that, I will uh, find the areas and compare them to check if they are indeed equal, okay, as an example. So for now, let's take a break. So my computer says 9 o'clock, so I'll see you in 9.05. Okay, folks, so welcome back. So we are talking about how the area under such bell curve is same as the area under the rectangle made by the average force, okay? So to verify that, I am going slightly different route here. So I'm looking at triangle versus rectangle made by the same time interval here. So for that, I have to have average, right, force. So what is average force in this case? It starts from zeros and goes to 200, right? So to find average, zero and 200, so we are adding two numbers, means we need to divide by two. So this is 100 Newton. So F average is 100 Newton. So now, first let's find the impulse using area under. this one okay let's use that idea here so for that this is area of the triangle which is half base times height in this case base is 4 and there is millisecond for this example, I'll just keep the milliseconds, but when you are actually finding the values, you have to convert that milliseconds to the seconds, okay? So there are, so 1000 milliseconds is one second, just like, oh, not 100, but 1000, okay? Just like 1000 milliliter, Oh, I don't know how to write thousand, huh? Thousand milliliter is one liter, right? Just like thousand gram is one kilogram. Uh, kind of similar conversion here. Thousand millisecond is one second. <clears throat> so that means there are thousand milliseconds in one second. Here, we don't need that conversion factor. I'll just leave the answer in terms of milliseconds. So height, in this case, we are looking at triangle. So that is, it goes from here to all the way 200 Newton. Okay. So 200 divided by 2 is 100. So 100 times 4 means 400 newton times milliseconds okay so that's what we got using area under the triangle now this f average times time interval so what do we do that is area of this one Time interval. What happens? It's area 
under rectangle so that means it is length time width So a rectangle to find the area of rectangle, we just multiply two side lengths, right? So in this case, length is four milliseconds, let's say, and then width is this, which is average force, which is 100, 100 Newton. So you see this 100 times four is 400, Newton times milliseconds, so they are same. So that means this one, basically this idea works. And that's the idea we're gonna be using. If we have a rectangle force, a triangular force, we know how to find area under the curve. So basically those the example we're gonna be looking at. And here is one such example. So in this case, what's happening? The mass is given as a two kilogram. So that object is moving with initial speed of one meter per second. And it's moving to the right, okay? So if I choose the right, as a positive, then it becomes positive one meter per second. Okay. So when it experiences an impulse to the force shown in the graph due to the force. So here, the impulse is given in terms of force versus time graph, okay? Force versus time graph. So that's what it is given. So that means impulse is area of the rectangle. Here it is just a rectangle pulse, okay? So what is given another thing? Impulse is given, okay? Think it in terms of impulse. Don't think in terms of force and so on. So impulse is area of the rectangle that is given. I mean, impulse is given in terms of area. So in this case, how much is impulse? So this is product of this times this, right? So let's write the two Newton, but remember it is on the left side, okay, negative side. So that means we need to include that negative two Newton. Remember, impulse is a vector as well. Force is also a vector. So we need to keep track of their sign times Time interval in this case is one second, okay? So that means it is negative two Newton second impulse. And uh, that's the unit. But uh, if we like, we can also convert that into kilogram meter per second because impulse, same as momentum. Unit is same as momentum because impulse is equal to change in momentum. But for now, just leave it like that. So it's asking for what is the speed. So in this case, what happens? Object is moving to the right and force is force acts to the left for one second, just one. So for example, let's say a chair is sliding towards you. It's rolling towards you. And then now you want to stop it. What do you do? you apply force in the opposite direction of motion. So it slows down and eventually stops if you keep pushing. But here what's happening is 
this is acting just for one second. And after that, so you just give a little thoughts for a second and then let it go. Then what's going to happen? What do you expect the chair to, you know, slow down and may still be moving or may stop? It depends on, you know, how fast it's acting and uh, was that impulse enough to stop or it simply slowed it down, okay? So we want to figure that out and we can do that by using this idea. For example, here, final speed. Is final speed zero? If it is zero, that means chair is stopped. If the final speed is not zero, then it is still moving to the right. If the final speed becomes negative, for example, for example, let's say if you keep pushing that chair, it's going to stop. And then if you still keep pushing, then it's going to reverse the direction, right? So you may also get negative velocity, negative final velocity. That means it reversed the direction of motion, okay? So let's see what happens here. So we can use, so here there is impulse mass and velocity so we can use impulse is equal to change in momentum so we can use that is also called impulse momentum theorem right Now the change in momentum is equal to impulse. And change in momentum is MBF minus MBI. It's the same object. Mass is not changing, only velocity is changing, right? And impulse, we already calculated it. If we did not hear, then it's a good idea to write, okay, this is area under here. Okay, if we did not already do that, then you want to write area under here for the impulse, right? So we are solving for final velocity. So let's move the initial velocity on the other side so it becomes positive. So it is negative here, goes to the other side, it's positive. So area under here is negative 2 Newton. Newton, let's convert that to kilogram meter second square. So that's a Newton times second. So this whole thing is a Newton, okay? So one of the second cancels, so that giving us kilogram meter over second. So now Vf is, let's divide by mass. So this is divided by mass and this also gets divided by mass so two kilogram meter over second but this one has to also be divided by mass so this mass comes here and divides each and every term or you can just write this whole thing divided by mass same idea same thing right so here i am doing something like this so the mass cancels there for the first term so VI is just positive one meter per second. And now let's look at this term here. So mass is two kilogram. So replace mass by two kilogram. So this kilogram cancel. So that's why I wrote like this. Okay? So this two also cancels, leaving us just negative one. So this was meter per second. And this is now also meter per second, makes perfect sense. So positive one meter per second, negative one meter per second, that is zero meter per second, means object stops. Okay. Now, 
this we got zero. But let's say, let's say if it acted for two seconds, same impulse acted for two seconds, or the uh, same force acted for two seconds, or let's say this became poor or something like that. But we can change either one of those or both of those. So let's make this two seconds, okay? So I'm now simply changing one seconds to two seconds. Everything are same, okay? And remember, this problem we already solved. That was the final answer. But now let's see what if this was two seconds, right? So that means two times two is four Newton seconds here. So eventually what we're gonna get is this gonna be four, this gonna be four, and this gonna be four. And now four divided by two is two. So that is negative two. So the final answer is now negative one meter per second. So what that means? That means now object is moving left. It was moving to the right with one meter per second speed. Now it's moving to the left with one meter per second. It simply reversed the direction because of that impulse, okay? So it's like soccer ball is coming towards you and you give a little hit on that soccer ball. And then what happens? It bounces and goes in the opposite direction, right? Same idea here. So this was rectangular pulse, and I have done very similar problem with triangular pulse, okay, in the note. And I'm showing you here as an example, and process is exactly same. So initial velocity in this case is two meter per second, and I'm writing that as a positive because I'm assuming right as a positive, okay? So here I wrote to the right, but we want to put that in equation. In equation, we need positive or negative sign, okay? So because of that, I assumed that as a positive, and we know here this force is given in terms of graph, force versus time graph. So that's why we are using this idea, just like we did in previous case. So we are looking for final speed. So process is exactly same, only difference is how we find the area. So this being a nice triangle, what happens? It's gonna be half base times height. And here you see the base is going from one to three seconds, means it is two seconds. So half times two seconds. And height, see it goes from zero to all the way negative four. Height is negative four Newton. So two, two cancels giving us negative four Newton seconds. So that's gonna go over there and everything else is like before, okay? So it is fully done in the note. Okay, so here is another similar question, okay? So in this case, we are not calculating speed, rather we are calculating the average force, okay? So what happens? This kid here is catching the ball or at this point trying to catch the ball. So while catching the ball, what this kid does is of course there is globe on, good idea, right? To, so that gives you some padding that increases the time. And similarly, what happens is this kid is also moving the hand. See, it caught when the hand was here. Now, the hand is there. And then see, before the hand was here, now hand is there. So this kid moved hand all the way this much distance. So that means increase the time, okay? kid increase the time. So increase the time interval. So here that's what it is saying. So interval during which boy stops the ball is eight milliseconds. 
So in this case, mass is 250 grams and initial velocity is 24 meter per second. And let's say that is positive. So that means it is, let's assuming initial direction positive. Initial direction positive. Okay. So now, so in this case, we can say, okay, it's going something like that. This ball must have come from this side. So we can also say, okay, right is positive. Okay. And the interval during which boy stops the ball. So that means time interval, delta T, or simply T is eight milliseconds. So one millisecond is one over thousand seconds. We can also write that as a 10 to the power negative three seconds, okay? So I can say eight times 10 to the power negative three seconds. So rather than writing 0 0.008, I like to write this. This is also called scientific notation, right? And especially handy while you keep track of significant figure. What is the average force boy uses to stop the ball? So V average is what? So we know impulse. So force is in the impulse equation and these mass and velocities are in the change in velocity, sorry, change in momentum, okay? Or I guess in the formula sheet, it may be something like that. So we can write something like that. So F average times time interval is impulse is equal to MBF minus MBI. Oh, we need final speed. What do you think the final speed is? Do we know that? If we do, can you type that on the chat? What's the final speed of the ball? So I see some zeros are coming. That is right because ball stops. Ball boy catches the ball, right? So that's that. So that means F average, so this is zero, giving me F average is negative MBI over time interval, okay? So now we can start plugging in. Oh, by the way, I forgot to change this gram to kilogram. We need that in kilogram. So there are 1,000 grams in a kilogram. So we can say, okay, 0 0.25. So this is just two sig fig. So we can write 0.25 kilogram, okay? So negative 0 0.25 kilogram and the speed, the initial speed is 24 meter per second and time interval is eight times 10 to the power negative three second. So you can see there is kilogram, meter, second, and the second gonna go in the bottom and gonna make it second square. So makes that kilogram, meter per second squared, which is Newton, okay? So makes sense, it's a force. So that means, oh, three, eight times three is 24. 
and this is 0.25 times 3 is 0 0.75 negative 0 0.75 times 10 to the power 3 see negative 3 becomes positive 3 when it goes up there or we can say negative ooh, 750 newton that sounds large I made up the question, so may not be exactly reasonable numbers. But anyway, that's, that's that. Yeah, it looks about right. Okay. So now this negative simply means 750 Newton. See, this, this is force, which is vector. So negative means opposite to the initial. I said initial was positive. So this is force from boy to the ball. So what happens? Ball hits the boy and boy basically applies force in opposite direction. That's the reaction force, okay? So it is in opposite direction. So boy, apply, boy is applying force in opposite direction of the motion of the ball. That makes perfect sense. That's what the negative sign there means, okay? Now, is the same force, uh, is the force same if the, you know, boy applies that force in just two milliseconds? So instead of 8 milliseconds, if this is just 2 milliseconds, will the force be same? Of course not. So this 8 becomes 2, means the force is going to be larger, larger by 4 times. Okay, Because time decreases by 4 times. 8 to 2, 8 milliseconds to 2 milliseconds means it's a factor of 4, right? Time decreased by a factor of 4, means force is going to increase by factor of 4 as well. Because force and time, they are related directly. There is no t square. Okay? So because of that, with whatever factor the force decreases, sorry, the time decreases, force is going to increase by the same factor. So that's what uh, that is. Or you can go through all this process and just replace that 8 milliseconds by 2 milliseconds, you'll get 4 times more force, okay? So 4 times of that is 3,000 Newton, I guess. Oh, looks very large. <laughs> Okay, so that's how we use impulse momentum theorem to find average force or to find the final velocity, or we may be finding initial velocity if we know the you know final velocity. For example, let's say with what velocity the ball was moving if boy applies this much force, right? If force is given and time interval is given, and you know final speed, zero, because boy catches the ball. So with what speed the ball was uh, coming? So you can calculate for initial velocity in that case, right? Same thing, but now you are solving for initial velocity rather than using initial velocity. Here you are solving for initial velocity. That's it, it's algebra, right? Okay, with that, now let's get back to our memory lane and try to answer this question. Oh, <laughs> they are crossing each other. Animation gone wrong. Okay, so they can collide and then bounce back, right? So it's talking about force, okay? Not momentum, not velocity. It's talking about force. So what do you know about force when two objects collide?
30 more seconds. And five more seconds, five, four, three, two, one, and it stops. Okay, let's see what we got. So mostly C. So yes, they are action reaction force. Great, most of you remember, but some of you forgot. Okay, it's force between two objects. So action reaction force, equal and opposite. So now it's talking about speed. Thirty more seconds. And five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one and it stops. Okay, let's see what we got. Speed of M1, bigger than, smaller than, equal to, or they want move after collision. Okay, so how do I answer this question? Looks like a bit confusing here. So it's a bit difficult, looks like. So we learned that force is same, right? In the previous slide, we learned force is same. Now mass. So force we know, mass we know. So it's smaller. Smaller mass means, so force mass, they are related to acceleration. So let's say that is acceleration. Smaller mass means larger acceleration. So if something is accelerating larger means So it looks like A is correct answer in this case. Okay. Okay, anything you like to add or ask on this one? Okay, then let's uh, move on. So here is another question and last question for this class for today. So air track 
on an air track. These days we don't use air track on the lab, but in the, you know, past years it used to be air track. So what that means is we are trying to make friction negligible. It's like object on icy surface, okay? Hmm. This one is interesting and challenging. So you have two minutes. Thirty more seconds. And five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, and it stops. Okay, let's see what we got here. We are everywhere. It looks like A and C popular. C is more popular than A. Okay, so how do I do it? So in this case, Mass of one card is just M, and mass of another card is uh, is two times M, so double mass, okay? And card for two seconds, so first for two seconds, and second is also the same length of time, okay? And force on one is equal to force on two. And let's say just F, okay, same amount of force. So now, what is the momentum? So that means final momentum, PF, of the second card is what? or the first card is what? So let's simply say final momentum for now, okay? So let's try to write the equation for one card and then see how one compares to the another one, okay? So basically everything else is same, only mass is different here. Mm. So now, if I were to use this equation here, and that's the obvious choice, of course. Momentum is mass times velocity, right? The only problem is B is not known. So that means if you answer this question by just looking at 
you know, this equation, you are answering this based on just the mass. Double the mass, double the momentum, right? But that is the case only if the velocities are same. So we don't know if the velocities are same here because it doesn't say velocity same, okay? So it looks like this is not a good idea, but there is force and time interval given, so that means we should be able to use this equation. So both of them starts from rest, so initial velocity is zero, means initial momentum gonna be zero. So we can say the final momentum, or P2, is simply force times time interval. So we can use that. We know force is same for both, and time interval of push is also same for both. That means the final momentum or change in momentum is same. So yes, C was popular, so that was the correct answer, okay? But A also got some idea here. Four times the momentum. I don't know, maybe you just multiply twice mass and two times second, I don't know. Uh, so anyway, so now, what, why the momentum is same, although the mass is different. So when you push by same amount of force for same time interval, speed of smaller one gonna be larger. Speed of smaller mass gonna be larger than speed of larger mass, okay? So mass is smaller by half means the speed gonna be exactly double in this case, actually. So since the speed is double, mass is also half, so product remains same for both, okay? So for this, speed gonna be half of whatever it is. So mass double, but the speed half means it's the momentum product of both gonna be same. That way we can look at it, okay? But this is not the equation to use to answer this question because speed is not known unless you can figure out the speed. This is the equation to use, okay? So it's asking for momentum, final momentum. So it may not always be the case that we're gonna be using the basic equation for momentum. We may have to use or find the equation that is related to momentum in terms of what is given in the problem, okay? So that's why noting down what is given and how they are is very important solving any problem. So it looks like uh, it's uh, time and this is my last slide for today. Oh, nice timing. So if you have quick question, you stick behind and ask or else I'll let you go. I'll see you next class, folks.